So this is uh, a lecture I gave actually only two days ago in uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. And I've, I've shortened it down from there because that was quite a long one. But uh, um, in the interest of sort of brevity and the fact that we've got 15, 20 minutes for this one, I'm going to skip through quite quickly the early slides so that we can get to, if you like, the meat and potatoes of the presentation. So this comes from my research that was uh, started in my, with my research that was published in, in 2011, which looked at depopulation in, in rural areas in Japan and their um, societal impacts. And uh, since then, I've been collaborating or at least working with some people in New Zealand um, and hopefully going to work towards uh, developing some kind of an international collaboration. But what I want to do today as well is to sort of advertise this research so that if there's anyone around who is particularly interested or, or would, would like to work more closely or would like to know more, um, I'd be very happy to talk to them. Um, so this uh, presentation really, or this research, is, is about the depopulation of, of uh, rural areas in Japan and, and uh, the, the crossing of the threshold in 2008 to uh, a situation where, where Japan as a whole, the whole country, is, is depopulating, the population is, is decreasing in size. Um, and the, the potential consequences not just for Japan but for the rest of East and Southeast Asia. Whether depopulation has to produce uncomfortable outcomes, um, whether it might even be embraced or, or people might benefit from it, and uh, to what extent any anticipated benefits are, are realistically achievable. And I want to focus on this issue of um, uh, the, the assumption that, that, that uh, fewer people on Earth might um, uh, result in some easily achievable uh, environmental benefits, such as, for example, reductions in resource consumption and so on. Um, there's an often heard refrain in the press, at least, at least in media and in public discourse, that the world is overpopulated and that um, fewer people would uh, result in these kinds of environmental gains. So there's three questions, really, that are driving this, this presentation, this research, is uh, what does a post-growth East Asia society look like? Can East Asia realize a, a depopulation dividend? And this is in reference to um, the, the book by Bloom, Canning, and Sevilla um, uh, called The Demographic Dividend, which showed the relationship between, uh, or at least posited the relationship between economic expansion and, and, and uh, uh, changes in the structure of the population. And what maybe what could a post-growth East Asian society look like? So looking at the first... Um, first question we see here, uh, gro rapid growth in the Japanese population in the late 20th century and then a shrinkage in the population in the early 21st century. Um, we see a, 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 a marked change in the population age structure from a, a large working age population to a small working age population, um, a, a predominantly young population to a predominantly old population. We can see how this works in terms of um, Japan's, the blue here is Japan, Japan's uh, child and old age dependency ratios. We see a, 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 an economically advantageous situation occurring in the late 20th century and then a turnaround and a progressively less economically advantageous situation in the 21st century. But we can also see very similar trajectories in both China and South Korea. So this, Japan is not an isolated case, it's not unusual, this is perfectly um, within uh, Japan is, is, if you like, a, a pioneer for a more generalized East and perhaps even Southeast Asian experience. Again, we can see that in a different way with population growth and shrinkage rates um, in, in Japan, uh, China, and South Korea through the late 20th and early 20th centuries, 21st centuries. Uh, in more detail and spatially, we can see uh, in the uh, late 20th century in Japan, a very rapid urbanization with developmental pro economic developmental processes, very rapid expansion in the Japanese economy in the post-war era here. Uh, consolidation in, in the, the, the late 20th century, um, but we can also see um, decreasing population in more rural areas fueling that urbanization. Um, later on, we can see a decrease in, in, in the rapidity of urbanization processes and a, and a, a more generalized increase in, in uh, rural depopulation. And then in the 21st century, we can see uh, that depopulation is no longer a rural phenomenon, that it is deepening in rural areas, but it is also now an urban phenomenon with a decrease in the, in the, in the national population. 
On a regional basis, we can see exactly the same processes going on. We can see very rapid urbanization in this 1950 to 70 period. N Niigata City growing very rapidly indeed, a sort of consolidation phase, but still quite rapid depopulation in more mountainous regions. And then um, a stagnation and then generalized uh, depopulation through the entire prefecture. Niigata is a very... Uh, a very typical, if you like, um, provincial prefecture in Japan. We can see here that in the 2010 to 2030 period, every single municipality in Niigata is shrinking, in in including Niigata City. Niigata is Japan's 14th largest settlement at 800,000 people. Um, what, is this, what have these processes produced? Well, we can see massive scale urbanization in, in the Tokyo metropolis, a metropolis um, of about 36 million people. Uh, super high density living, um, high rise multi use urban functions, and not just building up but also building down underground. We can see sophisticated high cost infrastructure to service that this kind of a, a, a massive scale urban environment. But what can we see in rural areas? Well, this isn't the Japan that we normally see in in uh, in, in Western media, but. Nevertheless, the, these scenes are very, very common throughout the country. We can see abandoned homes and farms, um, literally tens of thousands of them. Abandoned farmland. Bankrupted businesses. Retail deserts. Empty hotels and guest houses. Disused and decaying infrastructure. This was a junior high school. Um, of course, with the reduction in the number of children, particularly in, in rural areas, um, infrastructure that's dedicated to children becomes unusable and this now, this junior high school now is, is for example, is, is a um, really just a, a disposal yard for the local construction businesses. We can see collapsed industries, ghost towns. This settlement here is was built in order to serve this coal mine um, about one in eight of the housing units are, are currently inhabited, normally by older, single old, older people. We can see more ghost towns. So in Japan, we're, we're, we're experiencing uh, two kinds of shrinkage. We, we can see economic shrinkage, whereby individual settlements experience economic collapse and population loss with the disappearance of the core industry. This is very common throughout the developed world. Uh, this can be stabilized or even reversed. We just we only have to look at the experience of Sheffield in the 1970s to the 2010s. And it prompts some to ask why regional shrinkage in Japan is a problem. Because normally this, this, this is experienced around the world within the context of a, of a continuously growing national population. There are thousands of ghost towns all across the United States. But people say, well, what's the problem? The country is still growing. In Japan, we also have demographic shrinkage. So the demographic dividend was both an outcome and a cause of low fertility, but low fertility results in an aging society and eventually population loss. It begins in geographical peripheral and isolated com communities, but spreads to include towns and cities as aging and depopulation deepen. And, and those maps um, show it quite, quite, um, quite well, I think. What are the consequences? Well, Japan is a so society in the 21st century where gaps in well-being between groups and individuals are assumed to be growing and wi uh, emerging and widening. Wealth and income gaps, quality of life gaps, gaps in life chances, and so on. Um, one of these is the gap between urban and rural Japan. With the onset of nas national scale shrinkage, the areas caught in this rural decline trap are broadening to include provincial towns and cities. And revitalization, if it means growth, becomes impossible for most areas because mathematically one community one community's expansion necessarily requires another to shrink. Tokyo has the Olympic Games in 2020. We expect Tokyo to continue to grow continuously through to that uh, through to that year and, and probably thereafter, which means that mathematically, given 0.5 there, the rest of the country is necessarily going to have to shrink to accommodate Tokyo's continued growth. Can East Asia realize this depopulation dividend within these circumstances? Increasingly large areas of the country are, are, are decreasing in, in population. We need to think about whether um, Japan can show us evidence of um, the, these easy uh, environmental gains being achieved in depopulating areas. Uh, I 
I've just thrown up a sort of a, a, a quick definition here that uh, it's any benefits for socially and environmentally sustainable living that can be de gained from depopulation it must occur in peacetime and by non-coercive means and those are some examples of where these sorts of things might happen, might, these sorts of dividends might occur. For example, in international order, Lee Kuan Yew, the ex-president of Singapore, speculated that um, older and, decreased, uh, and, and shrinking societies may be less prone to go to war with each other. Exactly, children are very precious in those, in those mm -hmm. sorts of situations. And they're less precious in very, very, uh, very, very mm -hmm. rapidly growing populations. Um, let's look at uh, an index of per capita energy consumption and carbon output in Japan from 1990 through to 2008. There is more, more recent data available, but I'm just really waiting for the, the for population census to take place next month, is the next population census. So next year will be a time when we can produce more up-to-date data, which will also accommodate the, sw the, the close down of the nuclear power facilities after the, the Fukushima disaster. But we can see here, um, of Japan's 47 prefectures, up until 2008, through this period, um, 23 of them were shrinking and 24 of them were growing. So it's roughly half and half in terms of the territorial area of the country, in terms of the population distribution. We can see that um, shrinking prefectures, energy consumption, and carbon output has been growing more rapidly than growing prefectures, which is confounding to some extent. This is this, the assumption that there are easy environmental gains to be had from decreasing the world's population. Indeed, we can see that the, 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 the correlation is much more strongly associated rather than with population, but with uh, economic change in economic output. Um, looking at this a, a little bit differently, we can see that those, those prefectures which have um, a negative population change in, in this uh, nearly 20-year period are the, are, the, are the very same prefectures where per, per capita energy consumption has grown most rapidly. So, for example, Kanagawa, Shiga, Saitama, Tokyo, Aichi, and so on. These are the very economically productive um, uh, prefectures of Japan. Their uh, energy, per capita energy consumption has not been growing very rapidly, but in these prefectures, they're, they're, who, which are shrinking most rapidly, Akita, for example, here, and Totori there, um, their energy consumption is growing most rapidly. So, thinking qualitatively now, what could a post-growth East Asian society look like? Um, well, first of all, through my research and, and my collaborations with colleagues, we've come up with a sort of five-stage process of community revitalization from experiencing shrinkage and trying to regrow, trying to sort of hold back the tide, if you like, uh, then letting the tide come in, acknowledging that regrowth strategies have failed, acknowledging and accepting shrinkage as a fact of life, and then developing strategies to realize perhaps some, some socially and enviro social environmental gains from depopulation and uh, achieve community revitalization through those means. Are there any examples of communities in Japan that are doing this sort of thing? Well, there are certainly many communities in Japan that have recognized that um, community growth is impossible, that shrinkage is inevitable, and that they are um, moving towards um, a, a notion of sumiyasui tokoro, a, a place that is comfortable to live. And Sado Island in, in Niigata Prefecture off the west coast of Japan is perhaps one of these places. Um, the, the mayor of the town, a very dynamic political figure, has uh, defined this new uh, uh, economic, social, environmental um, uh, situational circumstances that, the, that they are within to try and aim for a sumiyasui tokoro, a, a, a comfortable place to live. A focus on well-being in the broadest sense, it's not anti-growth in the traditionally modernist sense, but an acknowledgement that growth is no longer possible. And it's a search for an alternative to prioritizing growth. So it's focused around, um, th this says, mochido toki o tobue, which is uh, towards the crested ibis flying again. And the crested ibis is a, is a, is a native bird of Sado Island. Um, the numbers uh, catastrophically declined under persecution from rice farmers to one remaining bird in all of Japan. Uh, it's the national bird of Japan, and that one remaining bird was in Sado. Since then, they brought in some birds from China, some breeding birds from China, and they've, they've started to try and uh, boost numbers. But this is a, a, an in initiative based around creating an environment 
in which the, the, the toki, the crested ibis, can, can live um, naturally and in harmony with farmers and the population of the island. It's a sort of symbolic initiative as well as a practical initiative. Part of that, the, some of that success has resulted in uh, Sado and a, a, a portion of Ishikawa Prefecture receiving globally important agricultural heritage status from the Food and Agriculture Organization through their um, biodiversity and uh, enhancing agricultural activities. Um, I can go through that if, later if you want. Part of it is to do with um, improving tourism, lifestyle opportunities based around culture, environment, and health and well-being. This is one of the world's top uh, triathlon meets that is now held every year in Sado. Um, this is the 18th, the 18th time was in 2014, so it's been going quite a few years now. It's one of the, the, the Ironman events. There's, only a very small number of Ironman events worldwide, and Sado is one of them. Um, part of it is bringing uh, people from uh, islands throughout the world to Sado to discuss what it's like to live in an isolated community, uh, in a rural community, and to uh, enhance well-being through interactions and exchange and uh, exchange of information and understanding with people worldwide. It's about uh, using native attributes to reach out beyond the community, the region, and the nation. So here is a, 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 a Taiko drumming group called um, uh, Kodo, and they're based in Sado, but they're internationally known. They've even come to Sheffield to, to, uh, to play. I, I, I saw them in Sheffield about 10 years ago. Two more minutes. Pardon? Two more minutes. Okay, we're nearly there. Um, this doesn't mean that everything... Uh, uh, that, that uh, the economy is, is, is completely collapsed. There are some successful economic, um, uh, there are success, some successful businesses in, in Sado. This, this sake brewer is, again, is reaching out to, to the world to try and export his sake um, to the Nobu um, chain of restaurants in, in, uh, around the world, and Robert De Niro is a partner in, in this. Um, film tourism, environmental tourism or ecotourism, so what are the implications? Well, um, there is potential to decouple the link between growth and well-being and to manage decline to enhance well-being de by developing a new citizen ikigai, or that which makes worth, uh, life worth living. Uh, less prioritization of growth per se, more, on, more prioritization of, of well-being in the broadest sense. But there is a need to develop accurate and precise tools for assessing whether strategies for sustainability and revitalization succeed. And we go back to the, the energy data there, which shows that we need, we need to really understand what's going on in, in, in a very precise um, and accurate way to, to find out whether these environmental and social gains are being delivered. Uh, there's an expected future uh, in increase in the future incidence of large-scale techno-environmental shocks across the East Asian region as East Asia develops. The Tohoku tsunami and Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster were sort of, uh, if you like, a canary in the coal mine in, the, in that respect. Um, the, for example, the, the huge explosion in, in Tianjin recently is another of these sorts sort of events. Um, might rural areas, therefore, and turning around the assumption that uh, urban urban areas and urban living is is in the vanguard of, of uh, economic and social development worldwide, that might therefore in in East Asia, if we turn that around and, and start to think about rural areas being in the vanguard of social and economic development in East Asia, uh, in, in leading Japan, uh, urban Japan into uh, realizing some of these gains, and might therefore Japan, as the, in the vanguard of East Asian depopulation, lead the rest of East Asia into a, a post-growth future? Those are sort of very idealistic questions, but um, nevertheless I think that's, that's what we're all about here in, in, uh, in, in academia. So, thank you very much. And, uh, questions. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions or comments.